Hey, welcome everybody to Help at Home, where, where we are having a conversation every single week about things that we maybe need a little bit of help with. Last week, you may have caught, we uh, taught a little bit about how to give a haircut at home. Um, I have not had one of those, so excuse uh, the mane that is happening on top of my head right now. But this week, I am super excited because we are bringing one of my favorite humans in the entire world uh, to come and talk with us uh, because we know being at home, being at home with your family, whoever it is that's in your home for week after week after week brings challenges that maybe we didn't anticipate. And I would like for us to begin to see these challenges as opportunities. And, and I know that's easy to say as someone who is single and has no children. And so I'm bringing in someone today who is not single and has had some amazing children, if I say so myself, um, but is also a marriage family therapist who is uh, an expert, if I say so, about relationships. Uh, he loves to talk relationships. He loves to help people grow closer together, to help people walk through a difficult season. So I'm gonna bring him out in just a second. Before I do, I want you to know this is a conversation. If you have things to add, ideas, thoughts, questions, please feel free to comment. Uh, it is a chance for us to learn and grow together. So please, by all means, do that. Uh, right now, I'm going to bring in our guest. Uh, his name is John. Um, he also goes by JB. Uh, to me, he goes by dad. And so if I call him dad, I apologize. Um, but this is my dad. He is a marriage family therapist. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, Okay. Yeah, most people call me JB. Um, I am a, mar a licensed marriage family therapist. I live in Northern California. And so, you know, I'm sure the problems in California are much less than the pop problems that they have in Denver. I don't, I don't actually, it's probably the other way around. Anyway, um, I've been a therapist since 2006, but I had qu quite a life before that already. Um, I was going to be a, a pastor, or actually I was a pastor for a while, but back in my college days, I took psychology only because I thought it was going to help me know how to relate to people. And then I went to seminary, and I was not really thrilled at seminary, I'll be honest with you, and I didn't know about this calling by God. And then someone invited me to work at a Christian mental hospital with high-risk kids, and I absolutely fell in love with it and it changed the kind of course of my life. I've been working mostly with adolescents most of my life as a high school counselor, working at the mental hospital for a while. Um, I was a youth pastor and started a youth program at a church that my friend started up here in Northern California. And I think one of the things I realized is I loved meeting with kids and we had many a counseling session and many talks and many things. But what I came to realize over time is that relationships really get formed a lot in community and in community, namely family. And I began to think I could probably have more impact on families and on the kingdom, so to speak, if I could help kids still, yes, but if I could also help families and maybe couples, because the Bible speaks pretty clearly about this. You know, what comes now follows in further generations. And so I have been a therapist. This is not a good life plan. I'm not going to promote it. But I went back to school to become a therapist when Kelsey, this dear Kelsey here, was in high school. And I had two in high school, one in junior high and one in elementary school. That is not the time to go back to school. But I had some means to be able to pay for it and it was a crazy time. Um, but then since then, I am now in private practice. I see quite a number of clients every, every week, more so during this season of, of coronavirus stuff. My, yeah, people are coming back now and wanting to talk about things. I'm getting new people. It's kind of a crazy time. I also work in an organization, a nonprofit, that we give free counseling to kids who wouldn't normally get it. So we have grants and other things, and we're in elementary, junior high, and high schools. And I'm a clinical supervisor of interns who are dealing with these kids all the time. Matter of fact, about an hour ago, I finished a supervision with seven or eight, seven clients, seven interns who are just doing incredible work helping kids, I really believe, helping to save lives. And yeah, 
and now we're doing everything by Zoom. So this topic tonight, um, I'm seeing it firsthand in my interns. I'm seeing it firsthand because I'm doing it all video and I'm talking to kids and parents all the time. I kind of feel like this is a topic that we should probably have like a, a weekend, you know, 12 hour time. We're going to talk about relationships for, I don't know how long this is going to go, but we're not going to touch on everything here. So I, you know, I just finished a class I teach at a college here called the psychology of relationships. And we just spent a whole semester talking about how we get along better with people. So I'm going to give you a few tips, um, give you a few things that I'm, I'm hoping will be helpful. Some of it is a mindset and kind of how we view things, not just like a formula. So know that I'm going to try to touch on both. What are some practical things? What are some things we got to kind of be putting in our brains and, and dealing with within ourselves as parents and as kids? And I'm kind of assuming I'm talking more to parents here than I am to kids, but either way. So that's kind of where I'm at. We have a place up here. Kelsey said I could promote this. So I'm sitting right now at the Red Bench Retreat Center. My wife and I, we lived in China for a while. We came back. I was a little depressed because I wanted to be back there. We said a retreat center for people who come. Well, two years ago, God kind of plopped one on our lap. And so if you want to take a look at what it looks like, like you're going to make a reservation from Denver to Northern California, but it's called the Red Bench Retreat Center. And so this has been just an incredible journey. I'm hoping to use it for counseling couples, possibly bringing families in, um, mostly helping church staff and, and, and other leaders kind of find some renewal, relaxation, whatever. So anyway, that's the latest part of our journey. And that's where I'm sitting right now. So that's Which it. Which is a pretty amazing place if I say so myself, but that's not totally why we're here. Um, wanna, I'm gonna start with a question. Again, if you guys have questions, please feel free to drop them in the comments. If you have comments, please drop them in the comments. I saw a couple of you that I'm like, you have some good things to add to this. So please feel free um, as we are going. Um, my first question, I'm a big advocate of name the problem. Um, it's easy to say, well, coronavirus is the problem, but what are the specific stressors that have been added to families in this season that can make these relationships more complicated? Okay. Well, and so I'm really going to be naming things you probably are seeing firsthand already. But what we're seeing with our students, especially, but even with the parents, we're talking with them. There's just kind of this sense of, of lethargy or apathy that kind of comes like, oh, my goodness, I'm doing the same thing every day, all day. And, and some of these are really not all that fulfilling. And so for some people and for some students, we see it, it really is. Uh, this just doesn't seem to have any meaning or purpose. So one of the stressors that comes is we don't really have meaning or purpose anymore. And, you know, there's just a sense of boredom. Okay. So these are kind of the tame ones, but more so what we're seeing is, and, and this is why I know I have a job for the rest of my life as a therapist, because my theory goes, if you put any two people in close proximity for any long period of time, there will be conflict. And there are different views of how we view life, of how we think life should be done. There are definitely times where people get triggered by one another. And, you know, and, and usually people go one way or the other. Even, either it triggers a, some out and out conflict or it triggers some kind of avoidant kind of stuff. So I see both of these as some of the stressors that go there. And then not to mention, I'm, I'm a firm believer that uncertainty in our lives breeds fear. And fear breeds anxiety. And so one of the other things, and anxiety, maybe you, you could take it another step further. If you're anxious about, I don't know how this is gonna end and I don't know what this is gonna be like, and what is this going to mean for our world? What's this mean for our family? What does this mean for our health? It can become kind of depressing. And we have this chemical in our brain called cortisol and cortisol triggers 
when we have stresses. And so I see a lot of people whose cortisol levels stay elevated. And when they stay elevated, that they have a harder time even just dealing with emotional regulation. They have a harder time knowing how to cope with things. And then that definitely has effect on the people around you. And then not to mention, add the stressor of income becomes a different thing altogether. For some of you, you know this firsthand, that just being able to make it and make it financially. And what here we go again, uncertainty. What's this going to mean for the economy? And that just kind of breeds a kind of under, underlying kind of fear that definitely, you know, we call it in my, my world projecting onto other people. Then we end up projecting some of those feelings and thoughts on the people we love the most, unfortunately. I was going to say, I'm pretty good at that, actually. When I'm feeling pretty frustrated, I know exactly who to take it out on because they have to still, you know, love me at the end of it. So I, I feel that. Sorry, Dad, that was probably at you sometimes. Um, Lisa Alvina dropped a question in, or a response to, we've been uh, struggling with unexpressed, unmet expectations. And I know that word expectations um, is a pretty big one. So um, agree with that entirely, Lisa. Uh, with that, though, I'm a big fan of saying, you know, there's two sides to the season. So uh, while we are all feeling these stressors, while we're feeling these increasing levels of anxiety, and I have seen it specifically with students, an increasing level of anxiety that just stays, um, which is exhausting. Uh, there's also some silver linings, uh, which I know is a big thing for you. So what are some of the unforeseen silver linings that families have experienced in the season? Well, I'm, I'm glad Kelsey brought up that term because that, and I'll give my wife credit for this one. She's a school teacher. I'm a therapist. We're working harder than ever sitting here in our home. And, and she's the one that about a week and a half ago said, you know, JB, we got to do a better job of finding out what the silver linings are. And so that's kind of become a bit of a mentality. And so when Kelsey brings it up, I want to say, yeah, it, this is kind of one of those things you also almost have to make a conscious effort to do. Like we live up the hill from, from where we both work. We have to drive a half an hour to go to work and a half an hour buck back up the hill here in the mountains every day. Well, I haven't filled my car up in four weeks. You know, it's just sitting in the driveway. So I'm saving so much money on gas. I have an hour more of time every single day. You know, I get to spend I get to come home and have dinner with my wife now at, at a at a decent hour. So what are the silver linings? Of, of this and and maybe uh, uh, okay another kind of psych term I guess is kind of like a reframing we almost have to reframe our mind to see you know this isn't Kelsey said it right at the beginning here this isn't all challenge and 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 heartache this is opportunities to have things that we haven't had I had one of my interns today even just saying you know one of the things that they have found and she's she's married she says our life has slowed down I don't know what you guys' life was um, before all this, but okay, I live in California. I don't think Denver is all that much different when you live in the city. We fill our lives and fill our lives and fill our lives, and we're running from one meeting and one thing to another. And many of them are good things. I'm not critical of the things we do necessarily. I'm critical sometimes of the amount of things we do and the amount of things that we have to think about and that our kids have to think about. So one of the silver linings is you have less things to have to think about and, and really run around doing, okay? The other silver lining is there are now opportunities um, to be able to do things together that maybe we never did together before. Maybe cooking meals together and, and just you know allowing different people to take over each day and kind of do it. Maybe being able to have times where we can play, you know, that um, maybe watch. Obviously, the one that I hear all the time is that people are streaming things all the time and watching together. But I want to say maybe it's time that you just have together. Um, I will say I love going to church, but I also love sitting on Sunday mornings in my pajamas with my cup of coffee and watching church. And 
You know, I've watched your church a couple times. You know, I can, <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> a silver lining is I can go to whatever church I want and nobody will know which one I went to or I won't, you know. So, I mean, maybe that's a silly thing and these are small, okay? But other silver linings. Um, and this one is a hard one for most people. I find one of the silver linings is I'm just quiet more mm. and I can reflect more. And I can just sit more and I can allow things just to kind of be and learn to be comfortable in my own thoughts and in my own space. And maybe if I can help my kids do the same thing, well, my kids are all adults, 23 to 31. So I hope they do this as well, but that way you can give your kids, you know, instead of seeing it as boredom, see it as a time just to be able to reflect and see. You know, um, maybe we're going to get to this in a little bit. But, you know, there are many. Well, I have a few other things about what are other things that you can do to kind of manage? I don't know. Kelsey, is this the time for that or is that are we going to come to that later? Well, let me um, drop in a couple. First of all, Jennifer Borsma, it's good to see you. Hi, I'm so glad you're here. Um, for us, hubbies get to spend time with kids. Um, Sonia, get to spend time, especially with teenagers. Um, in fact, her picture right there is her senior who uh, is going to be leaving soon. You get more time with him than ever before, even though it may be pretty hard for seniors in this season. Um, Lisa, more relaxed mornings, homework free evenings, which I've heard from a lot of parents. Um, just the joy of being able to spend time with students in this season, that they are not as filled with drama, not as filled with angst as far as what their social circle may be um, giving to them. And so thank you guys for throwing that one in there. I know for me, um, I'm going to just give mine, especially because you seem to be frozen. So I'm hoping this will fix it here for a second. Oh, there we go. Um, I have spent more time talking to my brothers in the last month than I did like the last year. And really the only difference is that we are choosing things differently than we were before. And I love that that silver lining exists. Um, I think we can hear you. You're a little fuzzy. We'll see what happens. Let's let's okay. move to this question. I think we'll get to some specifics here in a second. Um, okay. This is one that I don't have a ton of experience with. So I'm going to let you be the expert and I'm going to just nod along. Um, one of my favorite things about my parents is that they taught me what love looks like um, and marriage matters. And not that their marriage is perfect, but it's been uh, cool to watch. So how can people in this season who are overly stressed out in their marriage or really loving this time that they didn't have before, how can this season give marriage a boost? Well, I will say you will have time to have other opportunities that you do. You just kind of alluded to this. You have time to do things that you wouldn't normally do. Like I would like to think that you can go on walks more often. You can take the dog out. I would like to think that you could possibly, okay, I don't know if any of you are readers, but you could find a book or something to, to look at that you could do together and discuss, okay? An activity I give clients sometimes who have had a hard time knowing just how to connect and talk to each other. I say, look at each other and we don't know what to say. And then it becomes a bunch of issues or things. And so I give them this thing called GLAD. It's an acronym, G-L-A-D. And so you, you, here's the key. You do it together alone. I usually tell them, sit on the bed, in the if you can do that, okay? And look each other in the eye so you touch it. And then I say, here's glad. This is not difficult. This is not hard questions. The G is gratitude. What's one thing today, today, that I have gratitude for? The L, what's one thing I learned today? either about myself or about the world or about, you know, and then A, this one's a hard one sometimes, but what did I accomplish today? It doesn't have to be some huge project. Maybe I just accomplished how to be quiet for half an hour, you know, whatever. And then the D, what's one thing today that I took delight in? And then you graduate from being able to do that a few times. And did I say you need to sit close to each other and look each other in the eye? Scientific research will say, if you can't look somebody in the eye, or no, I'll mm -hmm. say it the positive way. When you look someone closely in the eye 
there is something literally in your brain that connects and is rewarded and you will make a connection. So that's why one of these things about doing everything by Zoom and everything, it's fine. You can still kind of look people in the eye, but look them in the eye. And then do the glad thing about one another. Here's one thing I'm grateful for about you. And here's one thing I've learned about you. And it could be today or it could just be, but find ways to connect. Uh, I would say if you can uh, maybe even sit down and say, okay, what are the goals we have for us as a couple? Not as parents necessarily, just as us as a couple. And write down two or three things that you'd want to keep and maybe write two or three things that you say, hmm, not helpful in our marriage or actually hurts our marriage. And actually write up, maybe make a poster of them and, and kind of have that kind of discussion. Um, I would want to say, if you can find a game or activity to do together, beautiful. One thing we have out on our table right now, my wife and I have this thousand piece. I'll be honest with you, it's quite an irritating puzzle, but we have a puzzle. It has too much one color in it, for my opinion. Okay, so it's taking us forever. But I actually did the research on it, and I won't give you bore you with the details, but doing a puzzle together is uh, really good for your mental health and for connecting you, even though, this is the weird thing, we don't say a word to each other while we're doing this puzzle. <laughs> you know, maybe even sometimes we're a little competitive and we see who puts more pieces in it, but we just sit and we're just relaxed and we can be alone with one another. And if you have kids, they can join you in that as well. Um, another thing is if you can promote, one of our favorite activities is to watch a movie or something, and then we'll sit on the floor, one of us, and the other one will do a back rub for 10 minutes, and then we'll swap, and we'll swap like eight times in any given movie. And we just have a time where we get to watch something together, we get to have some physical touch with one another, and we just do it. Here's another one for you, if you wanna look at this one up, okay? Um, if, if you can look up John Gottman, or you read any book by John Gottman, He's like the expert in marriage, okay? He's the marriage guru for us in the therapy world. And he has something called a love map. Google it, look it up. It's a game you can play together. It's a little like the newlywed game, kind of. But see who knows the other person better. They're just fun questions. And I think it will help draw you to a better place. Um, one other one. I'm sorry, I'm just giving a list on this one. I really do find I really don't enjoy cooking. I'll be the first to say it. You know, I'm not. Whatever. And one of the we're cooking at home. What a good thing. And when we cook together and we eat together and we clean up together. It is time that we can just have. It's amazing. You know, my schedule means I was getting home late a lot. And so now I'm home a lot. And so we have an opportunity to be able to do it. And then take turns as to whose recipe you do. This one you can do with the kids too. Get them involved. Get them looking on food.com and, and create a few few good things. So I don't know. Is that kind of where you're going with that, with the marriage thing? Absolutely. I also, everyone, this is Kylo. I can't control when they decide they want to sit on our, my lap, but this is one of them. So if the other one makes an appearance, there you go. Um, I can attest to the fact that his his favorite thing to do is not cooking. Um, but I, I live with fond memories of uh, tuna noodle casserole. So I give you some credit for that. Um, also, yes. um, there's apparently, this is good to know, uh, there's an app, the Gottman Cards app. So. There you go. Might as well check that out. Thank you, Lisa, for that. Sounds good to me. I'm not going to download it, but I'm excited that you have it and you can teach me all about it. Um, Leslie comments to doing devotionals, having lunch together, doing things around the house. Um, well, and I'm gonna, as a student person, as someone who hangs out with, with your kiddos a lot, one of the coolest things that you can do for your kids is to love your spouse and carve out time for your spouse. And one of the coolest things you can do for your kids is to um, show them, thank you, hi, yeah, 
uh, show them things like that together. Truly, they want to learn from you, even if they pretend they don't want to learn from you. So that's pretty fun. Can I add um, to that? Yeah, go Can for I it. Can I just add to that? So I, I, I know some of you maybe this relates to and some maybe not, but just being able to pray together. I, I will say this as a therapist, I've seen many couples over the years, and that is really a struggle for most couples, just to pray together. So even to go for a walk and pray, and on your own, let me just say one other thing. One of the best things I can do for my marriage is for me to just really reflect on the strengths of my, my spouse, of Kendra. And if I really, you know, John Gottman, okay, I just referred to him, he calls it being cast in stone, that sometimes we see one another kind of cast in stone, like, yeah, that's who you are, and that kind of bugs me. And so sometimes we need to kind of reframe and be able to see another person the way God sees them, with grace. This is true with our children as well. We see them as problems, and we lose sight of who they are, you know, and, and that they are God's children. So sometimes just thinking about it helps, sometimes praying about it, that I really need help because I can't sustain just thinking positive all the time. Not something I can always do on my own. That's fair, especially in this season. Yeah. Um, with that, one of the things I've been hearing from students a lot in the last probably week, more than the rest of the, I've heard it was seven weeks. I have no idea how long we've been in this position. I am not someone that is keeping track. Um, someone, if you have an exact number for how many days Colorado has been in stay at home, let me know. Um, Lisa, I think you may have an exact number. Let me know. But one of the things I've been hearing a lot this week is I am just tired of my family. I'm just tired of being together all the time. And so how can we learn to find balance of spending time together, but also spending time apart? How can we create those safe spaces? I was talking to Kelsey beforehand about this one, just bringing up the topic kind of gives the answer in some ways. Um, I, I, I want to stress when you're dealing with a lot of these kids, things with your kids, especially, as much as you can talk about it openly and collaborate with them instead of dictate to them, the more you can do that, the better success this will be. So, so like with this balance thing, what what would be now i know that this can become kind of a negotiation or lead into a conflict sometimes and you don't have to go every by everything your kids say well what do you think proper balance is well i think 10 hours of playing online shooting games and then i'll spend a half an hour with all of you at dinner and and then okay mm, no that's not good balance you know and for some of you balance isn't hard. I have, I have quite a number of adolescent clients. And in some families, I had one family, I said to the, it was a, a 15 year old girl I was meeting with. She said, so what, I said, so what's it going like? And she said, well, my mom, you know, my mom and her mom set up a schedule. Okay. We're going to have this time to this time to do some schoolwork. And then we're going to have this time, this time, or we're just going to read. And we're going to this time, this time. And it created a beautiful balance. But can I tell you something? They had that kind of balance before coronavirus came around. They had that in place. For some of you, you say, oh boy, we'd be reinventing the wheel and they wouldn't do it. And I have other people who just kind of throw up their arms and say, whatever you want to do, just go and do. But I would definitely say, even through the eye rolling you may get, and even if you're trying to be collaborative, there are going to be times where you say, no, we're going to kind of insist that we have this time together. And I'm going to say the most obvious one is meals. If you can have meal times together, that would be great. I, I would also encourage you to have your kids try to stay on the same sleep schedule as what they're on now. Because, and I don't know, that's really one of those, yeah, good luck on that. Because I see a lot of kids who they stay up till three and then they get up at one. And not that that's wrong, but trying to keep them getting enough sleep. And I, I, one of the other balanced things, 
um, is the whole screen time thing. Mm -hmm. You are having an imbalance in screen time. I, I boy, we could do a whole evening just on this. And there's a woman, Twenge, I think is her, her last name, wrote a book on this. And she gives a lot of statistics and research. And the average adolescent, she says, is on there, is on electronics outside of school now about six hours and 40 minutes. And then she said, before you adults get all self-righteous, adults are on screen time of some sort seven hours a day. Okay, you guys, it's not helping us. So part of the balance is keeping that in balance and saying it is, an, it is not a bad thing to be on screens. It's only when it gets out of balance and to be able to have that conversation. And I, this is one where I want to say, I hate to say it, you're going to get a lot of eye rolling and, and kids who are like, what are you doing? That is unfair. Okay. There are going to be some lines and some boundaries you will need to draw. But I will say this, if it's any, any uh, encouragement, I just finished teaching that class to college students on psychic relationships. And we talked about their family relationships as a big part of our class and how protective and caring their parents were. And almost to a person who said their parents were overly protective, they also, I said, so how is that? Didn't you hate it? And they said, well, I did at the time, but I do see almost to a person. It was funny for me to see this, that they would say, but I get why they're doing it. And if you can do it in a context of love and do it in a context of, I know maybe you don't like this, but I do love you and I want best for you. If you can kind of balance that the balance, you know, parenting is a balance of setting boundaries and setting relationship in place. And when one or the other gets emphasized, we run into problems. So if it's all about rules and, and schedule and all that, you're going to lose it. So I'm not sure that I'm not giving you maybe a lot of specific things to do. I would definitely have things where you guys are looking at each other in the eye and doing it. Um, and the most obvious one to me is mealtime. And we used to do this. I don't know if we did it when you were at home, Kelsey, or not. I know when the two younger boys were home, you know, we had these, I don't know. Parenting is a lot about just trying things and see if they work, right? So we do these things where everybody put their phone in the middle of the table. And if you touched it during mealtime, you had to clean all the dishes. And so it was easy for me because I just turned it off and put it upside down. So I never touched it. Okay. The other thing we did that was really the other side of it was we would clear the table at the end and then we'd all sit back at the table and play a game. We played this one Yahtzee version of the Yahtzee game. I don't know what it is for the longest time. We played a card game called golf that the boys loved, you know, and whatever, you know, something that just kind of made us connect again before we just run off to our rooms. You know, even if it's 10, 15 minutes, something that creates a memory like that, go for it. Yeah, I can attest to that. I was telling my dad earlier one of my favorite things, and I probably didn't love it as a teenager, but we would read a Bible passage together at the table, and then he would ask us all age-specific questions, because there's nine years between me and my youngest brother. And so my youngest brother would get a all right, who was this story about? And then I'd get the, okay, theologically, what does this mean? Um, and I remember at the time just being like, well, I get it, okay. But now I look back at it and I go, I'm so grateful for the time. Um, we had a question and I'm going to address it real quickly. And then if you have more to add, you can too. Um, when it comes to teenagers, loving the idea of including them in the conversation of this picture of balance. Um, but with teenagers, it's hard. And I wanna say, um, not as a parent, because I'm not a parent, but as, someone who works with your teenagers a lot, they want to be included in the conversation. Invite them into that conversation. Say, hey, we need to figure out what works in this family. We need to figure out a good balance together. We need to figure out when we can connect and when we don't and encourage them to join in. Um, and what I've learned with teenagers is if you can give them the why, 
they're all in. So um, why are we putting our phones down? Not because I'm evil, not because I'm mean, but because I want to spend time with you because our relationship matters. And for you to communicate that to them helps them feel the love and the value that you already know you have. But maybe in this season, it's come out like we talked about at the very beginning as more of a projection of anger or hostility or frustration. And so phones especially can be a terribly difficult thing with teenagers. But what I've learned on mission trips, they can't have their phones um, during certain summer camps and things. They can't have phones. And every student comes back to me and says, the best thing you did for me was make me put my phone away. And I know, again. I'm the youth pastor. I am not the parent. So it is a much easier conversation for me. I do not even pretend it's the same, but it is it is something that they learn to value. I have several students who their parents take their phones during school time because you're not supposed to be on your phone and they don't hate it. Um, in fact, they've learned to enjoy being disconnected. And again, if you can emulate that, teach them, show them that you can do it too. Um, say all of us, like my dad said, putting phones, that was not when I was there because I didn't get texting till college. So we were not on our phones when I would lived in that household. <laughs> we had, I had a flip phone that was like a brick. So that's what I remember. I shared it with Kevin, my next younger brother. So I'm not sure that was a problem for me. It's now a problem as my phone reminds me every Sunday that I've been on my phone for eight hours a day. So okay. now I get it. <laughs> Can I add one thing to that, Kelsey? Yes, please. Please. Because I can't stress enough, if you can collaborate and talk about it and give the why, I'm so with you on that. And then the one thing to avoid, because I think this is the culprit for most of us, even as adults, what really drives a lot of our negative behavior is shame. Mm -hmm. And shame says, you're not good enough. You don't measure up. Why can't you be better? And just go watch, um, go watch good old Brene Brown TED Talk on YouTube called Listening to Shame. And then realize, kind of just evaluate, you know, this is where I'm embarrassed. And I don't even want to talk about this topic in front of my own daughter because I realized I put shame in there. I know I did. I didn't intend to. I thought it was a very effective strategy. And it really isn't. And I don't want to do things that are going to make my kids feel like they're no good. Like a word that I don't, I hope I didn't say it a lot. Please, Kelsey, don't tell me I did. But a word that I, to me, is kind of a shame filled word is the word lazy. You're just lazy. Okay. To me, that has now that has kind of a feeling of that you're no good. And so just be careful the kind of words you use when you're doing it. And by all means, you know, I'll, I'll go back to Gottman, and this is for marriages, but I think this is true of every relationship. A healthy relationship has five good interactions for every one bad. Mm. Okay. Now, a good interaction doesn't mean, you know, Kelsey, you are so beautiful and talented, and you're, you know, a good interaction is, hey, what do we want to make for dinner tonight? And you get excited about doing it. So, five good interactions for everyone bad. And so that's the goal. I like that. Um, I don't remember you ever calling me lazy, but I don't think that was a problem that I had anyway, so. No, you did not at all. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I probably went the other direction, but although we did fight when you told me I had to get at my first job and I was like, no, I have so much more important things. Now I look back fondly at Bed Bath & Beyond and I miss it greatly sometimes selling pots and pans sounds wonderful. Although they're probably not open right now. So that's fair. Um, this is more of a directed question to a specific part of this audience, um, but it's a part of an audience that I think uh, we need to talk to because you guys matter. Blended families, um, blended family relationships are, are challenging in and of themselves on a normal day. But now you add COVID-19 and you say, well, are they following the rules at this other household? Are they bringing people into the household that could be putting my kids at risk? Are they uh, bringing my kids out to Target when they shouldn't just to go shopping, right? Like we begin to play the what if game um, in blended families. How, what advice would you give to parents um, as they're trying to look at this uh, to help balance out uh, some of the anxiety from it, but also protecting their kids. This was a tough one. Um, 
when Kelsey was telling me we we're going to talk about this one. This is a, 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 a tough one because I think you probably have some of these fears and concerns and frustrations already many times. Like mm -hmm. you're letting them watch that and you're letting them put that filth in their head. And, you know, it depends. And and here again, okay, this is going to maybe, but I'm going to say it really depends because I've done a lot of dealings with blended families and from one to another, it is amazingly different. You know, you have two that can talk to each other, can set boundaries together. Hey, if I take their phone away or they lose their phone for one reason, I'll enforce it with you. Let's collaborate. Let's deal with the issues together. And then I've had other couples that I say, the only way you should be communicating with each other is by email. Do not try to have a conversation because my word on the blended families thing is this thing about how we're going to handle the COVID-19 thing is a conversation. And it's, it's a conversation that says, how are you viewing it? Here's how we're viewing it. This causes us great fear. We would appreciate if you can maybe keep them safer in this way. But that's like, wow, what a, an amazing blended family situation that would be. So Kelsey was mentioning before, well, can they go to an advocate or can they take go to court or, you know, do something like that? We're not in a world where that's even possible either. And uh, well, there, but here courts aren't even seen and they're not going to have this case come before them right now. You know, and so it becomes very difficult. And so some of it is, how can we work together better? And here are our fears. And we would appreciate if you would go along with us on this one. And here again, it's about helping them see the boundary and helping them see that we're doing this for the benefit of our children. But for those of you who are in blended situations and kids are going back and forth, some of you know, this is nigh to impossible kind of conversation to have even before coronavirus came around. And so it makes it much more difficult, but I still think you can bring it up and, and say, you know, these are things that we would like to not have happen to protect the children. Could you abide by that just during this season? And being able to have that kind of conversation is, is so, so important. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, if this even within any family, you have people who have different views on what to do about this and how to manage this. You know, Kelsey's brother, Kevin, I just had a conversation with him today. He lives in San Diego. He was so, I don't want to say mad, he was frustrated today because now they're going to put a law down again tomorrow. You know, we are the most sheltered in place state in the union. You said 49 days for you. I bet you it's 69 days for us. We we're one of the first ones. And now they're going to close the beaches. So, whoa, whoa what are we going to do now? Yeah, they're going to come and everybody's going to walk on the sidewalks right next to each other. That makes a lot of sense. You know, and so my point is, if you can have a grace-filled conversation, if you can not let it be something that gets emotional, if it does not become personal, if it really stays under the umbrella of we're really just trying to keep the kids safe, that that is how I would say this needs to be handled. Mm -hmm. But I'm open to hearing what other people would, would say about this as well. That's fair. And I, I can't pretend to have any advice for this one. That one's tough. Um, I have a friend who's in a blended family situation and she said, the thing that broke up our marriage was communication. And what you need more than ever when you have blended families is communication. And so um, learning to put differences aside and have some tough conversations is huge. You were even talking earlier um, off camera, how do we have conversations without taking things personally? And I think um, there's some of that that needs to happen too. They they may not be attacking. They may not be mad at you. It may just be the situation. And how do we how do we let some of that go? That's tough. That's very tough. If anyone yeah, does one, have, one, go for it. Can I say one last thing on this? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and this is true with our kids too. 
Okay, there's a book called The Nurtured Heart Approach of, of Parenting. Okay, and what it says is, you know, a lot of times kids, with kids, they're attracted to energy and whatever energy they can get. And so one of the pieces of advice that I think fits with the families thing too is catch them doing things that you do appreciate and point those out as well. Not just a conversation. Can I have a hard conversation with you about all the things that you're doing wrong to put our children at risk? No, I really appreciate that you do this. And if, if you can find some things now, be careful, don't make up things or, you know, give them so much energy for something that's really minor. On the other hand, I do know that you care about our kids too. And as much as you can kind of get to that place, the better. And I would say those conversations, for those of you who are believers, I'm going to say, please give that prayer before you have that conversation. You know, our old pastor, say, because God's kind of working upstream and he's kind of and I've seen it many times where the different I thought they were going to come into the conversation be some of that because they there's a force at work so you broke up a little bit but I'm pretty sure what you said is okay, when we sorry. pray we allow God to step in front and often we can step into some of those conversations and they end up actually being not as miserably painful as we think people come with a different heart because God's already been at work and I can tell you the amount of times that I've used that is insane and the amount of times God has just softened our hearts to those conversations I wonder how many times someone prays that for me and then I come into a conversation and then my heart is soft. It's just, it's an interesting thought that God is, God is working on our hearts in these conversations. That's, That's huge. Right. Absolutely. Um, we talked a little bit about this, um, but if you have more, what are, how can families connect in meaningful ways through this situation? And I want to pause because I have an answer and then I'm going to let you jump and own it. Um, one of my favorite things with teenagers, and this is possibly true with littles, don't have as much experience. Corey, I see that you're in the comments. By all means, if this works with littles, let us know. Ask them and learn what they do. Um, if your kid plays Minecraft, play Minecraft with them. If your kid loves, I don't even know, um, right now Call of Duty Warzone is the thing that isn't something you're gonna be able to do with your kid because you need to do two different devices. But if they love some video game, go play Super Smash Brothers. Um, let them teach you something. They have so much fun and it will open up conversations you didn't know were there. Now, anything you've got? I said some of these already, you know, find some activities that you can all do together. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on what you just said. Maybe you say, hey, tomorrow night, we're all gonna hang out for an hour and a half. Hey, uh, Susie, why don't you choose the activity we're gonna do this time and allow them to be part of the process. and don't allow Joey who hates that activity to opt out. Let him at least stay there. You know, even if he doesn't join them in what they can do, do some cooking of meals together. Um, go for walks together. I have had several clients who have actually said, you know, my mom and I went for a walk with the dog the other day. It was so nice. I just really enjoyed it. And so, you know, maybe these are simple. Okay. Maybe there's projects around the house that you could do together. You know, maybe now's the time where you go to one of your kids or each of your kids, if this is not, if you can afford it and have the time because you're work, maybe you're working at home, but maybe we're going to paint your room over this time frame, or we're going to redecorate, or we're going to do something that brings about a change. And so that we'll remember the time that we had together. Maybe we're going to do little projects, create little things for one another. Um, uh, I'm going to say one of the big things in my counseling world is just mindfulness. You know, that we are really just going to practice some mindfulness activities. And you say, what in the world? Okay, where, you know, we have this so nice where we live here. I can go sit out on the deck and I can just close my eyes and I just listen. I just let my senses, you know, the reality is of life, you guys, 
if if we are two creatures, we're a sensing creature and we're a thinking creature. Okay, where do you spend more of your time, thinking or sensing? And I'm going to say most clients I talk to about this say I spend about 95% of my day thinking. And when I'm just in my own thoughts too much, that tends to be judgments, it tends to be plans, it tends to be what my wife calls the committee. And the committee are those voices that tell you that you're not good enough or whatever. So if you can put activities in, look them up, they're all over the internet. Things you can do to just kind of get your mind on things that are positive. So maybe those are individual things, but I think they help bring you together as well. Um, maybe, I, I, I was showing Kelsey this today, that, and, and sometimes kids love this, sometimes kids don't, and let them choose them. But I went online and I found 365 table topic questions. So when you're at dinner, let you can choose one or let them choose them, but you answer these questions. Okay, this is not a very manly thing, but I actually went on Pinterest today. Okay, and <laughs> sorry, that's kind of younger and bad, but whatever. I and they had all kinds of table topic kind of things to talk about, and and some of them are just open ended. Some of these ones, even on this list, are a little heavy, and some are just fun. And just allow yourself and allow them or even let them pick out the ones, or say, hey, at dinner tomorrow, tomorrow, you come up with the funniest quote you can find, or the funniest riddle you can find, and you bring it to the table. And for you competitive families, then we all vote that whose joke was the funniest, or who's whatever. Allow there to just be fun, and make it, and don't make it for two hours, you know, these are just little touch points that you allow, so, you know, some of the things. And allowing them to have some contact, maybe even like this, outside, sometimes can help inside as well. We are going to get tired of each other a little bit. I don't think we can prevent that. Um, was there another one? There's probably a hundred things to do together. Um, but, Okay. I said puzzles earlier, I love that one, but here again, it's different for different people. If you can get outside and just do some fun activity outside, frisbee, play catch, shoot some baskets, I don't, I don't know. Is there a lot of restrictions in Denver on doing that kind of stuff? Uh, in our county, maybe. <laughs> okay. But not, not terrible. We live in a place where you can, you can get outside a little bit. Okay. So, um, Corey, I will work on finding that list, that Pinterest list. Uh, he printed it out, so I will find the PDF and attach it here. Um, I wanted to pause real quick. Alex, uh, little Alex is apparently his name because his dad is also Alex. Hi, I just wanted to say hi, Call of Duty. Nice. That's what I've been playing with my brothers, I feel it. Um, and this works for littles too. Littles love to play, um, creating little time with your littles. Um, absolutely, giving them freedom to help create the content. Even we as a staff, when we met in the building, we would have staff meetings and we'd sit at round tables and it would be a different group of staff members each time. And I may be giving away staff secrets and that might get me in trouble, we'll see. Um, but we would have a pile of questions in the middle and each person would draw one question and they'd have to answer that one question. Sometimes we'd find a question and specifically hand it to some people because we wanted to know. Um, but I think that went against the rules a little bit, but it was, it did, it made us grow closer. Uh, it made us learn about each other in a way that matter. And so absolutely questions are huge. Um, if anyone else has really good things that you guys do together, uh, let us know. Um, whatever you can do. And I'm going to say this as someone who's an introvert um, and needs my alone time. One of the good things you can do for your kid too is also to take care of that. If you need alone time, talk to your spouse, talk to someone about how can we balance this out so that we can have alone time so that we can be more present when we are sick of each other. Because again, it's going to happen. It's going to be, it's going to be good. Um, <laughs> Liz, I won't make you play towers anymore. Okay, can I tell us just a thing about the questions one? And I have these mm -hmm. boxes of questions in my office. 
and one's for teenagers, one's for families. You can buy them online. They're called table topics. They come in these plexiglass boxes. They're great. One for couples, one for families, one for teens. Maybe there's one for little kids too, I don't know. I'm just gonna tell you, I had a 15 year old girl in my office and we were just doing a little warm up. So I said, well, let's do one. And then, so we took them out of the teens box and then she made me take one out of the teens box so I could share on it too. And the one I got was describe the, uh, your first kiss. And I thought, there is no way on this good earth that I'm telling a 15 year old <laughs> girl about my first so be willing to have a little bit of grace, even in not making them answer a question to it. So whatever. Enough. Ooh, I'm glad you didn't answer that question right now, too. I don't want to know that. That is <laughs> that is not for an online experience. <laughs> um, well, and even I have been in a family ministry conference all day today. Um, and one of the things uh, Kara Powell said was that 90%, no, 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 I think it was 100% of the kids that they interviewed throughout a year, they did a study on students who were freshmen in college, and they did a study that said they asked, how many of you know the testimony of your parents? Not a single one knew the testimony of their parents. How did they meet Jesus? How did they get to know him? And so my encouragement to you as parents in your homes, share pieces of your heart. Allow yourself to be semi-vulnerable in some of those questions. Please do not describe your first kiss to your kid. As a kid, that is horrifying. Like, don't ever do that to your poor child. But be willing to share some of your mistakes. Be willing to share your journey on how you said yes to Jesus, on how you met your significant other, on how you proposed. Be willing to be semi-vulnerable. Um, show them a little bit of your heart in this season, too. If you're answering those questions, it makes it easier for them. Um, so... Again, don't answer the kiss question. No kid wants to know that about their parents ever. So it works out. Um, with that, my last question that I'm going to wrap up with here um, is in this season, more than any other season, we need grace, um, just space for one another to make mistakes, to own up to our mistakes, to walk through the mistakes, and to be kind to ourselves. So how can we extend and receive grace to one another in our homes in this season? And I know that's a really big question, but just some things, some thoughts behind it. Okay. I, I had some things down that I was going to say, and then I realized what really keeps us from being able to show grace towards others um, when we don't really know grace for ourselves. That whole thing that we project some of our own stuff onto other people and we kind of get into kind of a pity mode or we get into kind of a why aren't you meeting my needs mode or whatever so i'm going to say grace starts here grace starts from knowing that i am god's child grace starts from being able to say you know these people that i'm around are, are just as valuable as anything. But I'm going to say, I don't mean start with yourself like, well, it's all about you. But kind of, I want to say, don't neglect looking at where you're at and kind of being able to evaluate what is it that causes me hurt? You know, we sometimes talk about anger. No, we don't sometimes. In my world, we talk about it all the time. That anger and frustration, we, we, we make a... a, a picture of a, some of you have seen this, this is not very difficult stuff, but we make a picture of an iceberg. And what's above the water is about 10% of the iceberg. And that's the anger and the frustration and the arguing and all this. And what's below the iceberg is what's really driving that, which is hurt and fear and anxiety and uncertainty and kind of some of those vulnerable things that we don't want to look at. So know what it is that's kind of driving any hard feelings you may have and any hurts you may have. And then following right after that, you know, really work on saying, if this person is really frustrated right now and angry and is arguing, be able to ask the question in your own head first. What's, what is kind of, what's the hurt in this person? Are they really anxious right now? 
and kind of be able to pursue that instead of pursuing, we want to do with our kids a lot. We want to do um, behavior change. And I'm not saying behavior change isn't necessary sometimes. It's not that, you know, you are not going to talk to us that way and you're being disrespectful that way. Sometimes we have to have hard words like that. I'm not saying that, but try to understand where they're coming from and allow them to express it. The other one is I can choose to have grace every day. I can do it some of the time, but I heard a pastor say one time, the lowest form of power is willpower. And I can't just say, well, I'm going to put a happy face on and I'm just going to love you better today. And we can do that for a while until they do that one activity that drives you crazy. You know, they come and throw their dishes in the sink and they don't wash them off and they go back to their bedroom or you come into their bedroom and you find all those dishes on their nightstand and you've told them a hundred times not to eat in there and it triggers something in you. So not that that is their thing. Understand yourself and where they're coming from. And I do want to say, and I'm going to have to say sometimes, you know, I read that chapter in the Bible, the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not keep record of wrongs. You know, it, it lists all these things. And I'm like, wow, ouch. But it doesn't really tell you in that chapter, that's how you're supposed to love. No, it tells you how you're supposed to do it. It doesn't tell you how to do it. And mm -hmm. so there are other places in the Bible where it says, I'm going to need help. This is one of the places where I really believe that my faith in Jesus Christ, the rubber hits the road because I can't do some of those things on my own. And I really have to come before God sometimes and say, hey, I'm broken and I need help. And I'm viewing my, my family members and my spouse maybe in a way that is just very negative. And Lord, help me in my brokenness as well. So, yeah, it's kind of two pronged. So, okay. That's good. I, uh, the thing that you used to say to me growing up that I hated more than anything, and now I'm giving away family secrets, was, okay, they're being mean to you, but what do you think's happening in their home? And you'd always ask that question, and whew, it did me in sometimes. Um, but I hear it coming out of my mouth now, and I recognize it is a huge question before I take something personally what if I listened and said, okay, something might be going on for them too. Um, and I'm gonna, just going to say this, especially for those of you that have teenagers at home, this is way harder than you think it is on them. Um, and I know that because you guys have said it. <laughs> you're, you're watching your kid going, I have no idea how they're reacting, responding. And then your kid comes to me and they're falling apart, right? Like we, we see it. They want you to be there with them. They want you to journey with them. Be grace filled to yourself to say, I'm not gonna recognize all the things about my kid, but I just wanna be there with them. Um, and when they snap at you, it's not you. Um, they genuinely do want a relationship with you. Whether they say it or not, they do. And so allowing yourself to recognize you are their biggest cheerleader. You are their biggest advocate. You are their biggest source of life. Uh, and they may not show that to you well, but they need you and they want you and they love you. And there's so much good that you are bringing into their life. And so give yourself permission to make some mistakes. Give yourself permission to take time for you. Give yourself permission really to dive into your relationship with God. If that's how you, um, if you find yourself, if you're listening to this as a Christian, if you're not finding grace in other ways, um, that's huge. So thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Kelsey, are we done? Ahead. No, okay. wrap us up, okay. go for it. I'm just going to tell you, I could give you a litany of the ways that I didn't show very much grace, but one thing, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm, oh, some super spiritual guru guy or something, and I did not do this with Kelsey and Kevin, my two oldest, but I did with the two youngest. Um, when I would put them to bed when they were in elementary schoolish, and I'd put them to bed, and I'd say, so uh, remember that five to one ratio thing? This was one of the five, and I wanted to stay consistent in this because many of us have grown up ourselves, even as adults, and we think back and we think, 
My parents really only loved me and cared about me when I was doing exactly what they told me to do. And, and so I wanted them to know that that's not how I view it, even though that probably is how I view it sometimes. Okay, so I would say, so Kyle, Caleb, why does daddy love you? Why does daddy love you? And it became like this little mantra they knew. And what's the answer to that? Why do I love you? Because you're my sons. Mm. And then I would follow it up with the question, and, and how long are you going to stay my sons? And then they would giggle and say, forever, daddy, forever. And then I thought that was too much grace at some point. So then I said, but I got mad at you at dinner tonight when you criticized what mommy made for dinner. Does this mean daddy's never going to be mad at you or disappointed in <laughs> you? Because yeah, I guess I don't trust Grace enough or something. And I'd say, no, there will be times where I blow it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I love you. Mm -hmm. so whatever you can do every day to try to reinforce that in whatever way, shape, or form. If it's a hug, if it's a post-it note, if it's making cookies for them, if it's whatever, I don't care. Find ways to show, show grace, not just verbalize it. Um, you didn't do that with us older too, but what you did do is you'd come into our room every night and you'd pray out loud over us and we would pretend to be asleep, but we heard every word and it meant a lot to us. So. Tell your kids you love them as often as possible. Pray over them as often as possible. Hang out with your kids and give yourself so much space to make some mistakes and to keep trying. Hey, parents, you are doing better than you think. Hey, spouses, you are doing better than you think. And this season is an incredible time to get to know each other and spend some time together and build some new habits and rhythms that can build uh, just incredible amounts of love. So, um, Dad, thank you so much for being here. Uh, JB, whatever I'm supposed to call you, um, I appreciate you as um, a dad, but also as someone who knows something about this stuff. So thank you. Um, if you guys need anything, um, if there's things that came up that you want to talk about more, please know that we are here with you. You can email um, our care ministry. Uh, we would love to be able to connect with you, connect you to a therapist if that's something you're needing. And trust me, therapists are meeting on Zoom calls. I saw Carrie Chatterton on here. Um, there are people all over that are willing to meet with you. So please stay connected. Um, there goes my dog. Um, thank you guys for who you guys are. And thank you for being here. Dad, I'll talk to you soon. Uh, make sure you tune in next to our next one. See you guys soon.